For ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. And I was considering how this is a heart matter. The Pharisees and scribes were fulfilling the, the mandates of the law that were required, but they were not considering the Lord who had made the law and who had set it up. These men were the ones who were, were, who were to be showing forth who God was because of their knowledge of the law. They were the ones who had the most knowledge because of what they were doing. The scribes, another text talks about the scribes as well, how others looked to them for um, the help that they needed in Matthew 23 says, Then spake Jesus to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. So there were some, they, they were set up for people to consider and for the Jews to consider and to see how the things were to be done and how things were to be observed. And yet they had forgotten to love the Lord in the process, and by doing those things, it actually condemned themselves. They were seeking righteousness from their deeds and fulfillment of the law, but not seeking him through who put these things in place to teach men about himself and our need for a savior. They were not loving the Lord in his ways in doing the menial tasks. They were doing what was necessary to protect themselves from condemnation, but in effect, condemning themselves. It is true that the things that they were doing had to be fulfilled and had to be done, but to only focus on the things that is done is wrong. To forget God in supposedly doing his service is wrong, and we see that a lot now, nowadays and how it's the epitome of, of hypocrisy. Um, they did not love the Lord because if they had, they would have seen the reason behind the tithing, the reason behind um, the judgment, and the reason behind the other things that the Lord had required and would have willingly given more and done more for him, but, and by doing those things, being an example to those who, they were, who were under their teaching. Here we see the end result of what becomes of those who do what the Lord requires, um, but don't have a heart for him. They were condemned. They would not receive the goodness of the Lord because they are dead to him. They may look alive to others, like they are, um, they're clean on the outside, but they're full of dead men's bones. But the Lord sees the heart, and this is the real matter at stake the heart of the individual toward the Lord. When someone perceives the Lord as he truly is and loves him, then the Lord is pleased and glorified by this. And I've been reading in Romans, and I was considering how the, the arguments of fulfilling the law for a means of righteousness as opposed to seeking the grace that is given by the Lord and how these two things are related, how it shows the true nature of salvation, the inward parts being changed and conformed to the Lord um, and conformed to the Lord, shown forth in our love towards him and his ways. Where love of God is not found, there's no satisfaction in serving him, and there will be no desire to be with him either. It will be like the man who considered his master to be austere. There is a service there that is performed, but it's not for the man's benefit or for the master's glory or for his joy either. And the same is true here. Where there is no love of God, there is no benefit for the person who is engaged in the doing of righteousness. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave with one more text. It says, The lie of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body is also full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. If thy whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle doth give light. Amen. And now Brother Mike will come and expound this. Brethren, those who have joined us on live stream, <clears throat> either now or sometime in the future, one more time, the text is uh, from Luke chapter 11 and verse 42. But woe unto you Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. <clears throat> the first thing I want to address is whether Jesus is speaking of God's love for man, or man's love for God <clears throat> because the Holy Spirit Jesus could have said passing over the love for God but he didn't say it that way <clears throat> so it kind of left it open for us to uh, find out what he means <clears throat> now if we look at it just in the context Jesus is addressing man's obligation toward God because that this was the specialty of the Pharisees was the keeping of the law. and In fact, they had expanded what God had commanded into some say 600-something laws that they had 
extracted from what God gave. So they were very meticulous about these things. So that was, that's the context is what, what is man's obligation to God? So in that we could see Jesus is addressing the obligation to God is to, to love God. We ought not to pass over. Yeah. We're thinking of, when we're considering obligations to God and duty, let's not pass over the, the love of God, our love for God. Yeah. <clears throat> So they had not fully addressed this, and they did not properly teach man's true obligation to God because they, they had passed over this part of it. But on the other hand, we have to also consider that how man could possibly love God without knowing God and without knowing that God has indeed loved us. <clears throat> when we know God as he is, we're going to find out that he has been very good to the human race. The more we know of God, the more we love him. In fact, men do not have an accurate definition of what love even is without first considering God. Therefore, I'd have to say that Jesus is speaking of both man's duty to love God and God's love for man when he says the love of God. <clears throat> but especially his love for his people in this context, his love for Israel. <clears throat> the scribes, the lawyers, and the Pharisees did not teach either of these things, God's love for Israel or Israel's duty to love God, and these two go hand in hand together. <clears throat> the consideration of one must induce the other. But first, let's consider that man ought to love God. <clears throat> God has left his divine mark on all of his creation. You can see it everywhere you look, <clears throat> whether it's up into the heavens or on the earth beneath us. The heavens are an amazing creation. Its greatness and intricacies have not yet been discovered, and men continue to explore and to wonder and to theorize about what all is there and how it all works together. And it does work perfectly. The very reason that men take up occupations such as being doctors or scientists is because of what God has made, because there's great wonder in it. <clears throat> True science itself is a testimony of what God has done. And the planet that he placed men upon is a wonder equal to the heavens. This world is actually a giant system of things that work together perfectly. <clears throat> for the good of man, I might add. The variations in seasons, and there's ponds and lakes and rivers and oceans teeming with all sorts of life. There's creatures in the skies and creatures in the trees and creatures on earth and creatures under the earth. <clears throat> and there's places quite suitable for living in this world and sustenance for nearly everything that man wants to do. There's resources for food and for travel and for industry and building and medicine and etc. There's a lot of stuff here in this world. Even, even now in its corrupted state, there's a lot here that just, just sustains our lives. <clears throat> there's a lot happening on earth, and God created all of this. God's creation is indeed very good and marvelously good before sin came and brought corruption and vanity upon everything. But even today, the present heavens and earth, even with the tremendous weight of corruption on it, is still to be wondered at. <clears throat> its greatness has yet to be explored. The vast portion of it remains to this day unknown to man. But primarily, and most importantly, all men ought to seek out the good creator of all this. Amen. To find him and heartily worship him, and serve him, and yes, even love him. If a person didn't know anything at all about God, except that he created all of this, that's enough to come to the conclusion we ought to love him. Even if that's all you know, even without scripture. This is Romans chapter 1, right? This is, what he, this is what Paul said, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. <clears throat> 
Through the record in the Holy Scriptures, our Lord tells us how he created the heavens and the earth and all that is therein as a dwelling place for his higher creation man. <clears throat> and it tells us how he first prepared the Garden of Eden before placing Adam and Eve in it. <clears throat> and he made Adam from the dust and breathed the, his own life into him and formed Eve from Adam and the garden was theirs, <clears throat> all except for the one forbidden tree. And when they sinned, he cast them out in righteousness. And actually, this was a mercy of God that he did not allow them to live forever yeah. in this fallen state. <clears throat> and we can jump forward to Noah's generation where God destroyed the entire earth except for one family. So he, he, it was not his desire to wipe out the entire human race. <clears throat> But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. After that, he called Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees and promised him a seed that all the nations of the world would be blessed through him. And Abraham and Sarah miraculously brought forth Isaac, and Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat twelve sons, the twelve tribes of Israel. And, the, and out of them came Joseph, whom God sent to Egypt, and God raised up a nation in Egypt over four... 430 years they were there, and then God delivered them with a mighty hand from Egypt, bringing about the ten plagues upon Israel or upon Egypt. <clears throat> At the time when Pharaoh commanded that all the Hebrew baby boys were to be killed, this is when God raised up Moses, the deliverer, in Egypt. <clears throat> By the words of Moses, ten grievous plagues were visited upon Egypt before Pharaoh let them go. And the Egyptians were willingly spoiled of the Hebrews before they left. And Israel was led by God out of Egypt through the Red Sea on dry ground, through the wilderness where they ate manna from heaven and drank water from a rock. And God made the sun to stand still while they defeated their enemies. <clears throat> and the Hebrews that came out of Egypt were a nation raised up of God, chosen of God, on the way to the land promised of God. And we could go into more detail about what God had done for Israel, <clears throat> but suffice it to say that they were unique among all the nations of the earth. God had chosen them for a kingdom of priests, and he had set his favor and love upon them. <clears throat> In the beginning, before they even got to Canaan, God had already done sufficient wonders and goodness for them that they should have loved him with all their heart. Yes. In Moses, what some have called his valedictory address in Deuteronomy, <clears throat> chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, Moses says this to Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Now this is a commentary on the depravity of Adam's race, that after all this, they had to be commanded. God had to command his own people, thou shalt love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And not only that, but now approximately 2,000 years later, we come to our text in Luke, and Jesus has to say it again. Because the same, and I'm not being anti-Semitic here, what I'm saying is that these were the best of the people on earth. This was the best nation. These are the ones that God favored, that God loved. And even after all this time, Jesus still had to say it again and to, had to tell, tell the, the leaders of the people, you've you passed over the love of God. So this demonstrates to us <clears throat> that men in the flesh cannot love God regardless of what he does, <clears throat> outside of Christ we're talking about, men cannot love God merely by receiving a commandment to do it. <clears throat> <clears throat> he found that those who were favored by God, given the most by God, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants, the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom concerning the flesh Christ came, those who knew God best, those who should have been closest to God, still were not loving God. They were meticulous about the lesser parts of the law, you might say the easier parts of the law, <clears throat> but passed over the greatest part. 
which is the love of God. So sin has so corrupted Adam's race that man has to be told what is right and what is wrong, what to do and what not to do, what to love, what not to love. Man has to be commanded to love the right things. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, love your husbands. Children, love your parents. Everyone, love your neighbor as yourself and even love the Lord your God. Now, the only thing that man doesn't need to be told to love is love yourself. No one ever had to be told that. <clears throat> no man ever yet hated his own flesh. Why are psychologists so plentiful and flourishing? It's because fallen people love to be told to love themselves more. Go ahead, reward yourself. You work hard, don't you? What, well, don't you? You deserve it. Go ahead. Get that, whatever it is. Get, you deserve it. Be good to yourself. This is not what man needs to hear. The most popular message in the churches today and coming out of the churches today, we all know it, right? God loves you. That's, that is the most popular message today. God loves you. Doesn't matter. They don't care who they're talking to. They just spew this out. God loves you. <clears throat> he loves you so much he just can't bear to be without you. No matter what you do, you can't possibly make God love you less. It's all about you. You are the center of the universe, right? Instead of telling everyone that God loves them, perhaps people ought to hear this. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment. This is a requirement. <clears throat> now this statement of Jesus was brought on by a Pharisee who had invited Jesus to dine with him in Luke chapter 11. <clears throat> and he went in and sat down to meet. <clears throat> and when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And the Lord, now the Pharisee didn't say anything, he just marveled. And the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? Now how would you like to invite Jesus to dinner and he's got to call you a fool? That, well, that's what happened. He invited Jesus to dinner. Jesus, Jesus didn't hold back because he was, at, he was invited to dinner by the Pharisee. <clears throat> we'll get some other things he said to him there too in a, here in a few minutes. But in other words, you look good on the outside, but you're rotten on the inside. You render to God external things, but keep back the inward part. You have an appearance of holiness without actually being holy. In the mind of the Pharisee, now Jesus was not keeping the law because he didn't wash his hands before he ate. In his mind, Jesus was not meeting his obligations toward God because he neglected to wash before eating. As the, Pharisees had, had the, as the Pharisees had prescribed. You won't find that anywhere in Moses' law, you know. <clears throat> what should men render unto God? Hand washing and herbs? Is that what God asked for? Is that all? Well, the Pharisees made a great deal of their tithing. <clears throat> for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs. One brother pointed out that Jesus didn't say, you tithe but that you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, so as to make a display of extraordinary zeal for piety at the least possible expense. How much do herbs cost? Now how about an alabaster box of ointment? Now that, that was an offering acceptable. But herbs, a tenth of your herbs, and washing your hands, that's it? <clears throat> They boasted about their tithes of mint, but did not give God their hearts. They gave rue, but not their souls. They gave all manner of herbs, but ignored the greater issue of loving God. And not only did they practice this, but they taught it to others also. <clears throat> they completely passed over the love of God, even though the love, loving God is precisely and clearly commanded. <clears throat> and not only... 
did Moses say this? The love of God is not some obscure concept. Moses wasn't the only one who said this. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 6, God declared this about himself, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And in Deuteronomy 7, 9, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him. And Deuteronomy 10, 12, and now, Israel, what doth the Lord require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord? And chapter 11, verse 1, Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God. And Deuteronomy 11, verse 13, and verse 22, and chapter 13, verse 3, and chapter 19, verse 9, and chapter 30, verses 6 and 20, all these say, Love the Lord thy God. How could they pass over this? They were also reminded by Joshua before Joshua died. Chapter 22 and verse 5, <clears throat> which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways. And again, chap chapter 23 and verse 11 of Joshua, that ye love the Lord your God. Nehemiah said this in his prayer. And said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. And in the Psalms, O oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. And Psalm 69, verse 36, the seed also of his servants shall inherit it, that's Zion, and they that love his name shall dwell therein. And the 97th Psalm, verse 10, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Psalm 116, verse 1, I love the Lord, because he hath heard my voice and my supplication. The 119th Psalm, verse 132, As thou usest to do unto those that love thy name. And Psalm 145, 20, The Lord preserveth all them that love him. And Daniel made mention of this in his prayer in chapter 9, verse 4, keeping covenant and mercy to them that love him and keep his commandments. So it's not like this is some obscure text in the Bible somewhere about loving God. This is the, the old scriptures are full of this, and the Pharisees, just they just passed over it. <clears throat> they should have been known by the scribes and the Pharisees and the lawyers, and it should also be known by every believer. There is nothing that can make up for not loving God. Not good deeds, not church attendance, not Bible reading, not praying or anything else. <clears throat> so what have we learned from Jewish history? And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. No matter what we may know about God, if God does not help us, we cannot love him. Being commanded to love God is not sufficient cause for men to love God. <clears throat> the problem is that fallen man is not capable of loving God, as history so adequately shows. No man can love God unless it is given to him to love God, Amen. regardless of what he may know about God. This is where the other side of the coin becomes necessary. Men have to hear about God's love for them. <clears throat> and I don't mean... By this, I don't mean to say over and over again to people, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. That's not what I'm talking about. <clears throat> I mean that the gospel of Jesus Christ has got to be proclaimed and expounded if we are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yes. Those who do not faithfully proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ are indeed passing over the love of God. There is no way that people who hear them are going to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. <clears throat> the love of God is not found in routines and rituals. This is the testimony of all the people of God that we love him because he first loved us. Amen. Now from the perspective of the, of the carnal nature, <clears throat> the commandment to love God is like every other commandment he gave. That is, it, it can't be kept because it isn't written on the heart of Adam's nature. But God can give a new heart. And it is written there along with all his other commandments and statutes and judgments. 
That is the covenant that God has made, that he will take away the stony heart and give a heart of flesh. And that covenant is effective in the blood of Jesus Christ. When Jesus died for the sins of the world and God raised him from the dead, that covenant became active. <clears throat> that transaction is the foundation of the love of God, both of God's love for mankind and man's love for God. There is not a better definition of love. There is no greater example of love. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Amen. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts Amen. by the Holy Ghost, which Amen. is given unto us. Now, you, ca you can't have it shed in your heart without that. <clears throat> For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man would some even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. At the very core of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the epitome of love, that our God humbled himself and died for us when we were ungodly and sinners and his enemies. The declaration of that love and the expounding of it will compel tender-hearted people to reciprocate God's love with all the heart and all the soul and all the mind and all the strength. How can we prevent passing over the love of God then? <clears throat> By reminding people that God commanded it? No. By preaching Christ. As I say that, I am also very aware that the great majority of church people don't have the slightest idea what that means preach Christ. <clears throat> I have found by my experience in Babylonian churches that people think that Christ is being preached where they attend, but the manifestations of God's covenant are not there. Yes. <clears throat> Amen. How do we love God then? What is loving God? Does that mean that we just have good feelings about him? No, we certainly do not despise good feelings toward God and even emotions but what are the proofs that we love God? God showed and commended his love for us and that he laid down his life for us. That was certainly more than just a good feeling he had for the human race. Aren't there some ways that we can know that we love God? <clears throat> for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. And here again, the love for God and God's love for us can't be separated. How is it that his commandments are written on our hearts? How is it that they are kept by us? It's because he wrote them there. <clears throat> In love, he wrote them there. But also, we keep them because we love them and we love him. And his commandments are not grievous to us. We are in full agreement with God and with what he says. But whoso keepeth his word... In him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. There is no real love if there is no real union. If there is union with God and with Christ, then surely there is the love of God. And speaking of unions, here is another manifestation of the love of God. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. But whoso hath this world's goods, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is, <clears throat> is born of God, and knoweth God. Amen. Now we could just go ahead and read all of John's first epistle, right? That's, <laughs> that's what John's talking about. In his first epistle, he's actually expounding on the summation of the law. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> he's expounding on that eternal 
the abiding thing that is even greater than faith and hope. The love of God which binds him to his people, his people to him, and his people with each other. How can there be the Lamb's wife without the love of God? How can there be the new Jerusalem, the holy city, the temple of God, without the love of God? <clears throat> and we must also warn of the consequences of passing over the love of God. <clears throat> Let's go back to our main text again and consider what Jesus said <clears throat> to those who passed over the love of God. Here's some more snippets from that conversation. Ye fools, woe unto you, ye hypocrites, the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. And ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in you hindered. If the love of God is passed over, nothing else can possibly be right. <clears throat> Remember, the Lord threatened to remove Ephesus' candle for this reason alone, that they had lost their first love. Whatever else they may have done or whatever else they may have loved, that was sufficient reason to remove the candle, that they had lost their first love. <clears throat> so love that is not re reciprocated, that is not shared in union, has no eternal benefit. <clears throat> I'm talking about now from about God's love for the human race and that Christ died for our sins. That was God's love manifested for mankind. But now if that's not reciprocated, then it doesn't do you any good, does it? If you don't love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then Christ's death was of no avail to you personally. <clears throat> so it's got to be reciprocated. <clears throat> there will be a lot of people in the day of judgment who will testify to the truth of this not the least of which is that generation that crucified the Lord. <clears throat> so let us all do that we can to <clears throat> promote the love of God among the people of God. Amen. There is even greater reason to love God now that Christ has ascended up on high. It's not a bad thing to remind each other once in a while of the requirement to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind Amen. and all your strength. <clears throat> But there are also a great number of animating reasons to love God, as well as his love for us, proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the Lord's table, and the Lord's table meditation <clears throat> become more valuable in the light of the love of God. So love encourages love. So let us love one another as Christ has loved us. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Continue to preach Christ. Every time we speak, the subject of our message should lead to Christ and leave us with thanksgiving that God gave him to redeem us. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.